Hello and welcome to another episode of Chasing Excellence. My name is Patrick Cummings. I am here as always with Ben Bergeron, and we have a special guest. We've got a friend of the show this week. Julie Fouché is joining us every week here on the show. We dedicate some time to exploring how we can live a life of better health and increased fulfillment. We answer your questions about the five factors of health, dive deep on living a life of excellence, and explore the strategies and frameworks to help us chase what truly matters. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Julie, thank you for joining us. Uh, For the few folks who maybe don't know who you are, Here's the very high level bio. You're multi times, a uh, multi time CrossFit Games competitor, physician for Wild Health, which is a precision telemedicine practice, and you're a podcaster. What am I missing there? What else do you like to add to your bio for folks who maybe don't know you? Uh, that sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Those are good. I like those. Cool. Um, all right. So, Julie, thank you for joining us. We are, as we have done with Friends of the Show, we're just going to kind of fit you into our format here. So, uh, what we've got coming up this week or this episode, we've got questions about Current, our, our current health and fitness goals, appreciating the highs of performance and the lulls of everyday life equally, and dealing with rep shavers. <laughs> our workout this week is going to be a conversation about how to balance our health with our, with our ambitions and our work. And lastly, we'll wrap up our most recent 30-day challenge. Ready? Ready. Let's go. We Let's are it. going to so excited. start our episode. We're going to start, uh, as we always <laughs> do, with our questions about five factors of health, those few fundamental behaviors that most positively affect our performance, vitality, and longevity. Those five factors are how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we connect, and how we recover. And has, uh, as we have done when we have guests here, friends of the show, I have con- I've condensed these. Instead of five questions about the five factors, we've got three questions about three of those five factors. So we're going to get right into it. One, uh, this is from Adam, and it's in our move category. A little over two years ago, a group of us got together and started a co-op CrossFit affiliate in our town because the gym we had been going to was forced to shut down from lockdowns. It was also around this time that I injured my shoulder and I've been working my way back to full strength ever since. As part of my motivation to continue the grind of rehab, I told myself that my goal was to be more fit at 40 than I was at 30. Fast forward to tomorrow, which is my 40th birthday, birthday, and I feel like I have achieved my goal. I may not be moving more weight, but I feel like I'm overall more fit and healthy, not only physically, but mentally. So my question to you guys is how have your goals evolved as you've gotten older? And if do you have milestone goals or things that you want to accomplish at certain points down the road? So I thought this was a wonderful question for a former CrossFit Games athlete. So we're going to let you go first, Julie. Thoughts? (laughs) <laughs> well, I love this question and I say hats off to you. What was his name? Who asked Adam. the question? Adam. Yep. For having that perspective of saying, well, I'm not lifting as much weight, but I feel overall more fit and healthy. It it just makes me think that he's looking at health as a much more well-rounded um, perspective like you all do. And so I would say for me, that's definitely, definitely the case also. I think I have um, really stepped back from having specific fitness and performance goals over the last several years. And my fitness goals are much more around consistency and habits. And I Mm -hmm. just see that the results come from that, putting yourself in the right environment, you know, trying to, to be in a, in a CrossFit affiliate environment for workouts a few times a week, um, consistency with training, as opposed to having specific performance goals not to say that I won't have performance goals again in the future, but for right now in this particular phase of life, that's not a big focus for me. And I find that, um, it really supports my overall health. Like Adam was saying, not just the physical, but also mental, emotional, um, all of those five factors. Was that a hard transition for you to make from, I I imagine it wasn't, it wasn't a light switch where you just one day you just turned it on, but that, that transition from being so hyper, I imagine hyper focused on performance goals, numbers, metrics, Mm -hmm. et cetera, progress, hyper. (laughs) Was that hard to turn off like that part of your brain? It's interesting. It was easier than I thought it would be for me. Mm. I, but you know, the hard part is to still push yourself and to still care because I think that you can have this mentality of, Oh, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. Cause I'm not competing. I'm not, I don't have these performance competition goals. So who cares if I, you know, maybe go a little easier on this workout. And so I think that for me has been the, um, maybe the hardest part. I think that there are certainly times where I, you know, I've been using beyond the whiteboard since 2009, since I first started. So I have all my scores logged. I have, if I go in and look at Fran, I have like 30 plus results over the last, 
you know, 14 years. And it's, I'm not going to say there's not moments where it's hard to be like, wow, I've really, <laughs> really <laughs> slipped here. Um, but I, I can quickly, you know, d- redirect my thoughts into looking at things with a, a broader perspective and being proud of my efforts. And those, those benchmark workouts, I think are still great for me because often, you know, they do allow me the opportunity to push myself harder and to, to compare and to surprise myself you know, you realize how much that base of fitness that I had lasts. I mean, I think even the first couple of years after I stepped away from having competition goals, I was shocked by how much of that base of fitness really sticks mm-hmm. around. Even if you're training significantly, volume significantly decreases. Um, and so I can't, say, <laughs> I can't say that I still have that now, but, uh, but it is interesting to just to see how much of it, I mean, every year the open surprises me. Um, when you see how much of that is so much your mental approach, so much of the, the muscle memory and all of the repetitions you've done over so many years, and you can pull that out when you need to. Mm, absolutely. Ben, I, I, I also like this question for you because I, I heard you talk and I'm, I can't remember where, but you were talking about, um, actually starting to move more weight than you have in years. I, th- I think it was because you're back, which mm-hmm. we talked about before. Um, but it was, but it struck me as interesting. Cause like you might now be getting into a place where, because maybe you've got some more capacity is probably not the right word, but maybe a little bit more, uh, you're giving yourself a little bit more permission to maybe move some weights that you didn't. I'm wondering like, are you adding, or are you kind of, uh, thinking about metrics that you're trying to hit or is that not kind of front of mind yeah, for you? Um, so I'll, I'll get to that, but first I want to like just highlight because I think we glossed over this and um, Julie's not only a multi-game athlete, but she was like uh, one of the best of the best. So um, it's cool to hear the the approach that she's taking now in terms of it's more about the, the mental, emotional, and the physical aspects of that. Um, and um, Crazy to hear that you've done Fran that many times, Drew. I, I think most most. Work, I actually want to look it up yeah. now to see what. what your, do you know what your? Yeah, do you know what, <laughs> like off the top of your head or around? Like, what was your what was your best Fran ever? So I want to say it was either two hundred six or two sixteen, but I can't mm-hmm. remember. Let me look. That's a that's crazy because that's even like that's a bonkers difference too. Two hundred six to two sixteen. Okay, and just give some just give some reference that like where. What's your most recent or what's your, what do you, where do you think you are now? So it's been, I think I did it last year and I surprised myself. i am got to pull it up here because I think I did it in less than, in around, here it is, around three minutes, which was cool. shocking to me. Um, yeah. So I most recently did it. Oh, it was 2021. Okay, so it's been two okay. years since I've done it. And, um, well, a year and that was now. around. It a, was 243. 240. <laughs> so that's yeah. everyone's lifetime. Which li- is crazy. Yeah, lifetime goal that's, is to get sub three, <laughs> and Julie's doing that casually. You know, ten Which years removed I was from competing. Um, but I think that that's a really cool understanding that this focus on process over goals can actually lead to really, really good results. And there's this weird dichotomy, which is the more you focus on results and the more meaning the goal, um, for a lot of people that can actually be, um, um, a, a, a rougher sea to swim through than kind of just like pushing that aside and focusing as, as Julie said, said about the process. It's about consistency. It's about showing up and recognizing that for her to push back from that 243 back down to that 210, whatever it is, plus or minus six seconds. There's so it was 213. It split the difference. So there's so <laughs> it was 213. There's so much <laughs> trade off. And I think that that's the biggest thing that we recognize when we move away from this elite level is it's really this understanding of like, I'm not willing to sacrifice the trade offs. And if for us to get, um, to that, that goal, whatever it might be. And if Adam's sending himself for goals of fitter 40 than 30, I kind of like that as a, cause I like vision more than hard goals. I like a feel as Adam said, I feel like I am, I might not be moving as much weight, but I feel like I am. And to me, that's a much, um, stronger approach than, I want a 230 Fran to clean and jerk 300 to run a 545 mile because 
when you do that, you're always putting yourself up for this judgment of pass fail at every step along the journey. As opposed to this vision of long trajectory, distant horizon, I want to be fitter 40 than 30. The importance and the immediacy and the urgency of today's workout falls away a little bit. And it's just like, I'm just going to make sure that I'm showing up and putting in the effort. I'm going to show up and putting the effort. I'm going to show up and putting the effort, which means the process. So that's where I've fallen into. And to get to your question, Patrick, because I've done that without the idea of I want to be able to deadlift, squat, bench, clean jerk and snatch these weights, it's just happened. And this is what happens a lot, even with really high level teams, is the ones that say like, we got to go undefeated. We got to win the, the conference championships. We got to win a national championship. What you can end up doing, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you can end up putting unnecessary pressure on yourself. And um, mm -hmm. that can actually take away from the focus on today and or you end up pushing too hard on today and end up having to take a couple steps back. My whole thing is like, I just want to make sure that today is as effective as it can be with no steps back. And I just want to commit to that process of showing up six days a week. And I feel like if I do that, I'll achieve what Adam's saying. I'll be fitter at 50, for me now, 50 than I was at 40. Um, and I, it's, it's I, the kind of the, the proof is in the pudding right now is that I never kind of, you know, I, as you said, Patrick, and most people that listen to this, I had back surgery, um, a fusion, and I committed to like, I'm never going to lift above a 135 bar after that. But 10 years later, you know, I'm, you know, playing around with close to some old weights that I used to, used to be at. So, and it's just this, like, let go of the, res the, the results and the goals and just sit in the process. So that's where I kind of like, I, I'm not, it sounds weird in a chasing excellence environment, but I think goals can, um, can work for some people, but not all people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. I all love right, that. And I couldn't agree more with the letting go. I think that sometimes when we become so attached to the outcome, yeah. that becomes our own enemy or it gets in our way instead of, like you said, the process. And and we're probably going to have the best outcomes when we are not attached and we're just focusing on, on the process. I think the difference, like you said, between there's a difference between excellence and perfection. Right. Um, and so being so attached to perfection, I think can often get in our way. Would you say, Julie, you know, thinking back and, and Ben too, obviously worked with plenty of games athletes, that, that mentality, that mindset of process over goals, does that still feed that particular pursuit just as well as it does, you know, the three of us in our current states of life? Or is there something about, okay, if you're trying to get to the CrossFit games, like you've got to, it's, I mean, it is about process, but you've got to be hyper-focused on the results more than you're more than you would be later. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on it in, in having worked with a bunch of different athletes. It's individual. Some people are going to be so driven and commitment. They need the, they need the North star. They need to know I need to be able to swim a 500 in this time. They need to know that, yep. um, I need to be able to do this many unbroken bar muscle ups. I need, to, I, I need to strive to be able to, you know, podium at the games or bust other people. That's the, that's the unnecessary pressure. And it's going to be a massive hindrance that they need to overcome on a daily basis. So it really is what works for you individually. And same thing with business or personal life or anything else. You know, it's, it's, do you want to be able to like, is, is an earning goal good for you or not? And again, recognizing where that fits, you know, where you know, Julie and I are, where it fits in the trade-off of everything else. Julie, any thoughts? I, I agree. I think I, I like the idea of having a North Star, but it's it might look different for each person because I think you have to have somewhere that vision out there, but how attached you are to it every day. Um, you know, I don't know that, that being attached to a certain clean and jerk goal and thinking about it all the time is necessarily, at least it wasn't helpful for me. Um, but I think, you know, one example, when I first started CrossFit before I ever considered competing, it was two th summer of 2009. And so I had watched that summer's CrossFit games at Aromas. Um, and you know, Heather was one of the competitors. I was watching these women run up the hill and I'm like, 
this is crazy. And I never thought I would compete, but I printed out that year they posted, here is all the women's, you know, average times of all the women on the benchmark workouts. And here are the best times. And I printed those out and I put them up on my wall in my room, not thinking like, wow, I'm going to get these just thinking, wow, that's something that's impressive. And throughout the course of the next year, without necessarily focusing on those every day, every so often I'd look at it and be like, huh, wow, I, I achieved that, mm -hmm. or I'm getting close to that one. And so there's something about putting it out there that I think is important because we can often, you know, sell ourselves short if we don't have those goals or, or think that we can achieve things that are big, but then not being so obsessed about them every day, I think is, is healthy. At least it has been for me. Very cool. Okay. Let's jump into our next question. This is in the, our think category and it's from Travis. He asks, or he says, I have a regular full-time job throughout the week and do CrossFit Monday through Thursday. And on the weekends, I'm a professional wrestler. One of the biggest difficulties I have is, is creating this huge high on the weekend, performing in front of hundreds of people as a performer. But when I wake up the next day and sometimes even longer, I have the lull of going back to my norm. How can I better appreciate my daily life when I'm constantly chasing the high of performance? Julie, we'll give you this one first as well. Ooh, this is a good question. So I think, I mean, having a, a lull after any big event or any big performance is very normal. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like he's doing that almost every weekend, which just sounds like a lot to me. <laughs> I think back to, you know, for me, even growing up in school, at the end of a school year, I'd always have this big lull after all your tests and your finals or, um, you know, after the CrossFit games, or you think about Olympians, what it's like for them after, you know, a big push for a four year cycle. And it's a very difficult time. And so I think what has helped me is being able to, to just process that and know like, okay, this is a normal part. You have these ups and you have these downs, but then also on, you know, knowing what your next goal is. And it sounds like there's this contrast for him between, you know, the excitement of the weekend and then the like mundane kind of day to day. Oh, I'm going to my day job. It's not as fun as wrestling in front of a bunch of people. Um, so I think there it, it's a lot about appreciating, having gratitude or appreciating those other aspects of life. So, um, you know, finding what is it, even, even if it's other goals in life besides just the wrestling, like what else is it that makes you come alive? What else is it that you get excited about? What whether it's, um, you know, another hobby, whether it's being better at your job, better in your relationships, um, really rounding out all of those, you know, five areas, I think, um, can be very helpful. I think I can relate to this too. I think there's also something cool about it when you have sort of a double life, right? You've got, I can relate to <laughs> coming back. I remember one year coming back from the CrossFit games and you, you know, you land on Sunday night and then you go to school Monday morning and you're just like a normal person. And so there's something kind of cool about that too. Um, and being able to, to just be, um, you know, be in both worlds, I guess. Yeah. I think, um, I think that that's the, the strong understanding what Julia is lead, leading towards is that like, there's going to be the down after the high. Um, and that's, um, that's called the parasympathetic lashback. When you are in that mm. um, excitement, that fight or flight, you're in a competition, you're in an event, you're studying for an exam, you're, it's the big moment. Well, after that big moment, your body needs the rest and recover, and that's going to kind of push you back into that. It's going to force you into that, and it's draining. So just that level of understanding is the first one. And then I, I really think that this comes down to two things one of two things. The first one is for Travis is if I was to ask Travis, Travis, like I, I, you know, I love, um, heli skiing and I heli ski every single weekend and it's my thing. It's my jam. I, it, it's the thing that sets me on fire. It's the greatest thing I ever do. But then when I go back to my job of being an accountant, I don't feel the same way. Travis, what do you think I should do? Well, it, to me, it's one of two things. It's either recognize that that's real life. <laughs> you're not always going to have that. Like you're going to be able to go heli skiing, but you're not going to heli ski every single day. So recognize that there is this two parts to your life. There's this amazing thing, but then there's also like, you got to do the work or go all in. And like, if this is your thing, Travis, and you want to train this way and live this life and be around these people all the time, try and become a pro. 
Instead of wrestling in front of a couple hundred people every weekend, you're wrestling in front of 35,000 people you know, every three or four weeks and that's the life you're living. So that'd be the same thing. It's like either I'm going to try to work on a, on, for a heli skiing company or I'm going to recognize, accept the like radical acceptance of reality that this is a weekend thing and I'm not going to have it all the time. And in between, I'm going to live the, quote, more mundane life. But don't beat yourself up for this thing that is kind of just the way it is. I think there's also an opportunity to look at the, look at the lulls, the, the more mundane, as the, the bridge by which you get to go to the highs. In other words, you know, in, in Travis's case, he gets to do this every weekend. And I imagine the job is what allows him the freedom, the financial ability to say, okay, on Friday afternoon to Sunday night, I'm not, I don't work. I don't think about, I get to do this thing. And so it's not as if actually that they're separate. It's actually that one feeds the other thing. So the, the lulls, quote unquote lulls, is necessary for the highs. Without the lows, he might not be able to get to the highs. I, re I really like that aspect coupled with Julie's kind of double life thing, right? And I think everyone's like, Julie had it as a r incredibly high competitive CrossFit athlete. Travis has it as a wrestler. But other people have it as like, I go off into the wilderness on Friday afternoon and I'm living off the land until Sunday afternoon. I come back and I'm wearing a suit Monday morning and meeting with clients in a, in a mahogany boardroom. And it's like kind of that like yeah. that like weird that like weird but cool super amazing um, aspect that there, this isn't the the totality of my life. I have this other aspect too, which really lights me up. I think that's also what may, maybe can make us appreciate those things. If we were doing them all the time, they might not be as exciting. So you, when you just said that, Ben, it made me think about even being a kid and my my parents had a cottage on a lake, and so on the weekend we'd go up Friday night. We'd come back Sunday night and then we'd go back to school. And I remember some nights you're jumping off the boat. You're having so much fun. It's Sunday, like 4 p.m. And you're like, I don't want to go home. And then <laughs> next thing you know, you're in school Monday morning. But you're like, oh, yesterday I was jumping off the boat in the lake. That was so cool. And all these other kids, like they were just, you know, here playing in their backyard or whatever. So there is something, I think, about the excitement of it when it's more rare and something you look forward to. And it's not your every day. You know, people who, they say like people who live on a lake don't enjoy it as much as people who just go there on the mm. weekends. Mm -hmm. Was there a point in, in, in the training for the CrossFit Games when, when that performance, when those performance highs were kind of a, an actual part of your life, uh, Julie, where the, the mundane elements of training on a regular day, was that, was that ever hard to, to remind or to remember or to balance, like, oh, I got an, I got a two hour session here and I'm like three months from my next competition. And like, why am I, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I putting my, like, was there ever a disconnect between the competitive performance and the, the, the mundane, the lullness of the, just like the training for that next one? That's a loaded question, Patrick. <laughs> I could take a while <laughs> to answer, but I will say I had a, a lot of lows after the season. Yeah. So that, you know, fall period was always very difficult for me. And, um, but I found, you know, I think for, for anything, when you're training for something that big, focusing on the big thing will get in your way. Kind of like we were just talking about. So for me, it was always about what do I do today? What do I, not even what do I do today, but what do I do in the next workout? Because if you look at the, the, so much of it, it becomes overwhelming. So I really, you know, found a lot of, um, comfort in that, just focusing on what's the next step. How can I do the best I can do in this very next, you know, piece? Cool. Let us jump into our next question. Our third and final question for our first section here. This is in the connect bucket. The, uh, no name on this for obvious reasons in a second. I have a friend I've known for three plus years at my CrossFit gym. We have a similar ability level and each made, uh, each made the individual quarterfinals and age group quarterfinals this season. We're both extremely competitive and have the same coach for individual programming. My concern is for years, I've caught her rep shaving, lying about her score and time, cheating on the standard, etc. I know I need to worry about myself and not compare myself to others, but it's incredibly difficult when we are basically the only two competitive females in our age group at our gym. Of course, she always says she's quote unquote humbled during the open when she loses to me on almost uh, every workout, even though she'll almost always quote unquote beat me in competition class or training workout 
workouts. This is always followed up with excuses about one thing or another. So my question, how do you remain friends or train with somebody you know doesn't meet the expectations of honesty and integrity that you hold for yourself? I'll go to you this time, Ben, because I've been going to Julie first. So yeah. what do you think? Um, okay, a couple uh, approaches to this. The first is um, she's, ask, she's answering the question um, she's answering the question in her question where she said, I know, <laughs> I know I need to focus on myself, but that's incredibly hard. I mean, that's, that's really is the answer. Now that's also what's, what's really interesting is that's, um, not only is that incredibly hard, but that is the easiest way to navigate this is to just really mm -hmm. focus on yourself. The next level up is more challenging, which is if this truly is a friend, recognizing that clear is kind and having a difficult conversation. Now, there's more risk with that, but there's also potential for more reward. So it's up to um, this anonymous question person to, uh, to, to navigate, to figure out where the right place is for them. Cause it's, it's really where I would go, um, is have that hard conversation, but that's not for everybody. And I'm not saying it's better to have a hard conversation because if the hard conversation doesn't go well, you might not have a, a friend and a training buddy. That, that's a, that's a reality. But if it does go well, you solve the situation. So there's a more reward there, regardless of which tactic you take though, where she said in the middle of that question, I know the, I need to focus on myself, um, but that's really difficult. Yes. And then mm -hmm. when you're doing that, the, the idea is you're not, the goal of life is not to get everyone to meet your standard of honesty, integrity. That's not what we're trying to do. That's like saying, you know, um, I eat meat, vegetables, nuts, seed, little starts, no sugar, but my family doesn't. How do I get them to um, level up their nutrition without losing them in the relationship I have? It's the same question. It's first off, recognize that what's right for you is not what's right for everyone else. Okay. Focus on you still. Don't be influenced by that environment. You live your own life of integrity close to your values and principles. And then from there, figure out how, how or if the conversation is the right place. So in the nutrition component, like working with my in-laws, I didn't have that conversation for the first six or seven years. Mm. But the last four or five years have been, it's been a huge component of it because it wasn't the right place at the right time. But I'm also trying not to get them to eat like us. And it's the same thing. I'm not trying to get people to count their reps and do all the things like that. I am, but it might not be the right place for this person. So I, I think it helps when you kind of like change the kind of the same thing I do with Travis is like with me with heli skiing, not, okay, it's nutrition and people are cheating on their nutrition. Like, how do you have that conversation? Do you like, if you're going to, if you think that that conversation is going to destroy the relationship, I don't think you do focus on you. If you think that there's an opportunity for you to help the person, then yeah, let's, let's try to do this in as tactful a way as we can. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. I, um, I completely agree. And I think that, um, have you, have you guys read the 15 commitments of conscious leadership? No, but that sounds awesome. This is nope. a fantastic book and it has totally changed the way that I think about integrity. So chapter six is all on integrity and they there, I think it applies a lot to this situation because, you know, I think a lot of us think of integrity as like you said, doing the right thing, right. But the right thing might be different in each of our minds. And so, the way that this book defines integrity, there's four different components, but the first part has to do with keeping clear agreements. And so, you know, like you said, Ben, clear is kind. And what are the agreements that you have with this training partner? Like, did you enter into an agreement that says we're training partners? So we're going to agree to always count our reps, you know, and be honest about our reps and our numbers so that we can help each other be our best. Like, did you ever have that conversation? Is that an agreement or do you have some differing opinions about what is appropriate in your training relationship or your friendship? Um, you know, there's also the other component is about taking hundred percent responsibility. So oftentimes we're focused on, you know, 
what other people are doing as opposed to, okay, how did I create this situation for myself? So, you know, answering honestly to yourself, okay, how could I have, how did I create this situation? Well, one, maybe by just allowing it to continue happening without having a conversation. So every time it happens, you're probably feeling extremely frustrated. You know, it's, it's affecting your emotions, your performance. Um, versus like you said, Ben, if this is someone that you have a, a friendship or a close relationship with, um, you know, can you help to create a different situation by having a conversation with them? Um, which is another component, which is speaking your truth. So being honest, saying, this is what I'm noticing coming at it with, especially if it's someone that's a friend coming at it with giving them the benefit of the doubt, not being accusatory, but being curious, like, Hey, you know, I've a few times I've noticed I've counted the reps and I feel like, you know, maybe you're not doing all of the reps. I just want to understand why that's happening. Is that true? And why is that happening? And being curious mm -hmm. instead of being really accusatory. Um, and you may learn something interesting. Um, I think mo more than likely, if you come at a conversation like that, good things are going to come out of it for both, both of you and for the relationship. Um, and then the last part of the, the integrity definition there is feeling your feelings fully. So, probably you are, you know, feeling frustrated every time you see this happening. And so knowing that you've got to like feel that, let it go instead of letting it build and, you know, hopefully not one day erupting into a volcano when you get really mad. Um, but those kind of those four components, thinking about those and knowing that when you are not in alignment, when you are out of integrity in those four areas, that's a huge energy drain. And so being in that environment is draining your energy. Um, it's not necessarily healthy for the other person or for the relationship. And, and you may have this conversation and it may not go well, right? So you, like you said, Ben, you, you go into it knowing it may not go well. And then you may decide this isn't a healthy training partnership environment. I'm going to move on and that's okay too. Um, but I think for someone that, you know, you care about, you have a relationship with, even though it requires some courage and is, can be a little bit hard, only good things come out of having those hard conversations. Um, it may be very different if it's someone that you notice, you know, in class that you don't really, you know, have much of a relationship with, you may not feel the need to go to that extent, or it may not be appropriate. Yeah, it strikes me that both of what you guys are saying, you know, I think, I think oftentimes we get stuck in what we can call kind of the messy middle of situations where we don't really want to deal with it. And, but we also can't really let it go. And so we just sort of sit there and <laughs> are, uh, uncomfortable f for just the reason that we we're not facing it or we're not doing something about it. And so it strikes me that what both of you guys are saying is like, either decide, let it go, focus on you or go all in and see if you can't actually do something about, about the situation or about the relationship. Mm -hmm. The problem here, the challenge here is the lack of decision on which way you're going to go. And the lack of decision is what's actually causing the problem. It's just like standing there hoping that without doing anything myself, this will change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And knowing yourself, like, can you really let go? Cause there's, you can fool yourself there too. Like, oh, this doesn't bother me, but really it is. Right. And so a lot of the conversation isn't so much for the other person. It's for you. It's for clearing up that agreement. And I, I would guess if you have this conversation, no matter which way it goes, you're going to feel lighter and not feel so much um, stressed by the situation anymore. I love that Julie knew All what right. chapter the integrity chapter was Ch I, in chapter it six. Is on repeat. It's like, I, I listen to it every couple months because it's so, so good. good. <laughs> what was it? If it's that, if it's that good, what was it called again? It's called the 15 commitments of conscious leadership. It is, it was one of the best books I've read lately. Awesome. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for your questions out there. If you want to get a question into the queue, find me on Instagram, PS Cummings, drop me a DM. We'll get it into our queue. The three of us will be back in just a minute to have a conversation about balance and ambition and maybe even a little bit about work. So stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Landkind. Go to landkind.health and get your hands on one of the best productivity boosts I have ever tried. Thoughts on Landkind? Why do we like them so much? Okay. And we uh, do. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of things. First off, Landkind, it's not just a clever name. It's, it's like their sustainable stuff, right? So they give you stuff in a reusable glass jar. So it's not this pl extra plastic, all the rest, but even let's get to like what it actually, the actual thing yes. is. Yes. So it's a supplement called salidricide, which comes from the rhodiola plant. Good job saying that. The first time I said that I had to say it like four times rhodiola. Good. Mm. Keep going. Okay. Here's what it's like. A, and as you said, it's like a productivity booster. It was kind of strange for me to experience this for the first time because what I normally go to for that is good old friend caffeine. Mm -hmm. 
Well, caffeine has some negative things with it from the jitters to the half-life, um, keeps you up at night. This works very differently. It works on a more of a mitochondria level, literally creating greater access to the energy systems that are already in your body. So if you're trying to focus more, if you're trying to just get more energy for playing with your kids, if you're trying to improve your workouts, here's a cool kind of like usification is I, I tried it before going to like a social gathering. Mm, tell me more. It, it gives you this level of excited involvement. Yeah. I don't know how else to say it, but yep. like I was more outgoing. You were the best version of yourself. At least a better <laughs> version, which isn't hard. For like Does, I love hearing that because my wife will often threaten if we have to go out to see friends like past 7 p.m. She's like, I'm giving you coffee before we go because like- that's, And that's the thing is like- Yeah, I which is a terrible want, idea. Like this is my go-to for post uh, noon yep. energy because it doesn't keep you up at night. Yep. It's like if you're trying to reduce caffeine intake, if you need that boost at 3 p.m., this is the go-to. Yeah, 100%. If you want to see what we are talking about, you can go get yourself 20% off your first order or subscription at landkind.health. Just be sure to use the code excellence at checkout. Again, that's landkind.health. All right, we are back. I've been thinking a lot, uh, Ben, you and I talk about balance a lot, especially as a kind of a balance across the five factors of health, wanting to keep that kind of proverbial Frisbee uh, even keeled so that we're not over-indexing towards one thing at the expense of another thing. And one of the um, components of balance that I've been thinking a lot about is work balance. And we can call it work-life balance, but whatever the heck you want to call it. But just like the the uh, idea of like, how, where are you pouring your energy into? And Ben, like, I know you're at a place right now, just in this kind of this current context where, and we've talked about it, like you're pouring a lot more into work than maybe you did two years ago, right? For various reasons. And we can get into that or not. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. And Julie, I wanted, I thought this was a great conversation to you because like, to me from the outside, not really knowing you, like you've had, I imagine you've had to figure out how to heck to balance these things, right? The, between uh, becoming a doctor, becoming the CrossFit Games, all the other things. Like I imagine either accidentally or with a lot of intention, you've had to figure out how to find a sort of balance. And so I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you guys about this. And as I have, as is often the case, uh, when I'm thinking about something, I notice other things. And so I just want to kind of couch this in a couple, a uh, little bit of context. There's a, there's a professor who I really like, his name's Scott Galloway. And he posted something uh, recently. He said, if you want to be economically in the top 10%, much less the, the, much less the top 1%, you should plan on spending 10 to 20 years working and not much else. This is because the trajectory of your career is disproportionately set by your career choices in your 20s. I'm not telling you to work hard all your life. I'm saying your career choices in your 20s are more important than those you'll make later on and will set the trajectory uh, for the rest of your life. And then he finishes up with, I have a lot of balance now in large part because I had almost none in my 20s and 30s. It's been worth it. So choose a career path that has real potential. Okay, so that's one end of this conversation. And then I was listening to an interview with, his name's uh, Kevin Kelly. He's a he's a writer, a futurist. Tim Ferriss calls him possibly the most interesting man in the world. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, the exact opposite. He said, in your 20s, try and spend some time doing something that looks nothing like success. That's kind of crazy, weird, or orthogonal, unprofitable, maybe dangerous. That experience, as unsuccessful as it may look then, uh, could become the touchstone for your success, uh, your success later on. So I mostly bring that up just to... to point at the obvious, which is like, there's lots of ways to think about this idea of balance. And especially as we're younger, um, I think it's something that I think a lot of young, younger folks are struggle with, quite frankly. They don't know which end of that spectrum to point themselves towards. The, I'm going to go all in on this thing. Maybe it's the CrossFit Games. Maybe it's a business. Maybe it's uh, something else. Or no, that doesn't make any sense. I want freedom. I want to try things. I want to taste what the world has to offer. And so all that context just kind of in place. I'd love to just your th initial thoughts on how do you guys think about balancing the various things across your lives, whether it's work, family, health, hobbies, ambitions, whatever, like, where do you start? Like, where do you start to come down on how you do that now? And then maybe we can walk backwards to think about how we did that, you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. Julie, I'll let you go first. Whew, there's a lot to talk about here. This is a great topic, a great topic. And I think it's interesting that you have that, you know, like you said, you don't really know me, but you have that perception because I think mm. perception is not always reality. <laughs> um, and this has been such, I mean, I can share more about my trajectory and growth and I think 
um, you know, maybe starting with right now, it's, um, it's still messy. You know, I think I've had a very similar trajectory to a lot of people, although maybe a, a bit accelerated where my, you know, up until 2020, basically my life was 100% work and work meant mm. sometimes CrossFit, sometimes school, you know, medicine, but that was almost all all of my energy and all of my focus and the other areas really suffered. And I did not have balance as much as it looked like, Oh, you can balance school and CrossFit. Like you're so balanced, <laughs> but no, it was all work. And so the other areas of my life really suffered. And 2020, like I would think it was for a lot of people was a big gift to me in shaking things up and helping me to reassess sort of how I was living my life and what that balance really looked like and being honest with myself. I think I was fooling myself a lot and, um, has shifted. And so, you know, over the last few years, things really swung the other direction because I had a lot of catching up to do. So there was a lot less focus on work and a lot more focus on other areas like relationships, um, you know, mental, emotional, spiritual health growth in other areas. And I feel like only now am I kind of starting to swing back where I'm a bit more balanced across the board, but I've always been someone who has been very focused, very good at focusing on one thing, which has served me well in, in certain areas of life. Um, and so, you know, I felt like, okay, I really want to deep dive on these other areas for a while and, and I've experienced a lot of growth there. And now for me, my, my pursuit is, okay, how do I, how do I bring all this together and experience more balance day to day? Do you feel like you, you know, to Scott Galloway's point, which was like, I have balance now and he's late Mm fifties, um, because I didn't have balance for so long. Do you feel similar in some kind, which is like, I have balance now, but it's because I dedicated so much time to in this, in your case, kind of like work was the, is the balance now a result of the imbalance before, or do you feel like, thank God I got to this point now because that was unsustainable or unhealthy or whatever else? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a practical sense in that, you know, in terms of having more freedom, working really hard and having some freedom, like, you know, to, to be able to compete in CrossFit and go to medical school and support myself through that. And then, you know, work as a doctor and to be able to support myself, to have a little bit more flexibility. I think there is a practical aspect to that. Um, I also think that's how we learn. Like we learn by failing. And so I learned by going way far in the direction of work, experiencing a lot of pain from the other areas of my life that suffered and then learning and growing through that. And I think, I do think that there is a way where, especially now we're in a world that is different. I think that before, you know, you know, work looked pretty similar for a lot of people. It was like the nine to five, you know, you go to work, you come home, you have your family life now, especially post pandemic, things are changing and shifting in so many ways. And people are able to have, you know, side hustles or more flexibility between work and home. And, and I think that moving forward, we're going to see younger generations, have more balance early on because it's just going to be part of how they grow up. Um, and the world that we live in is going to be a little bit different. Um, so maybe there's a way to accelerate that learning process for me. That was my, (laughs) that was my path. I had to go through the pain. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I think this is, I think this is probably the topic we talked about probably the most on, on here. So I don't think people will be surprised really with my approach to this. Um, If there's the two examples that you gave, the one is like sacrifice early so you can have balance later. And the other is no, go all in on um, chasing adventure. And then um, that will lead to success later on. Mm -hmm. If the discussion is balance, those are two opposite ends of a spectrum. Neither are balanced. They're They're both both, imbalances of different kind. What they're both saying is don't have balance. What they're both saying is go all in now so that one is saying go all in now so you can have the freedom and the balance later. The other is saying take advantage now because later on you'll have the mortgage, the kids, and um, you'll be entrenched in a career so you won't have it then. I mean, that's just – both of those seem to miss the mark in the way that I view this. And it's, nothing is a right or wrong. They're all just different viewpoints. So to me, that, that idea of um, – sacrifice now so you can have the freedom later on. Well, that's that like the, the, the working 
towards some unknown, arbitrary, unguaranteed point in time that says, when I get there, not only will I get there, which no one knows that they will, but that they'll have the other things to fall back on. And they don't take into consideration the fact that maybe you burned your health and now you're sick. Maybe you burned your relationships. You know, you don't get to have those with those things. You don't have the passions that you did otherwise because you were all in. And now you are, I mean, how many people do we know like this, that you become addicted to the grind. You became addicted to it. Mm -hmm. So when you want to step away and you made, you were quote successful. So you may earn the ability to step away at age 45, but you can't. Because your identity and your um, hormonal cycle is built around this chasing the highs of the um, of the stress. Like I, I, I need it and I have to have it. For you to go, nope, now I'm going to kick it and hike the Appalachian Trail. It's not even an, it's not even an option, even if that was the game plan. And it's like, nope, now I'm going to spend all my time with my family. But you you don't have the relationship with your family because you spent you know, 75% of your time in the office or traveling around. So that one doesn't seem to fit it for me. The other one doesn't either, which is like the more hedonistic approach of like seek pleasure now and then buckle down later. It's just, that's the same thing in a different way. You're never going to have the freedom because you're chasing these, you know, short-term pleasures or these adrenaline highs, or whatever they are. To me, it's always been this, um, can we define success? And success to me is like, I feel like I'm doing it all right now. Like I'm not sacrificing anything for anything else. And again, this idea of the Frisbee on the pencil, it's okay for it to wobble and it's always going to wobble. There's no such thing as perfection, as Julie said. But to me, this pursuit and chase of excellence is that there's some level of balance and it's never going to tip and spill off the side. If we can understand that that's the thing we're chasing, and we have the ability in some way to blur the line between work and play. If, and I'm not saying it has to be perfect. I'm not saying Monday morning needs to feel like, um, you know, you're, you're playing in the playground as a six year old. I'm not saying it's going to feel like your ultimate, pers- you know, um, pleasure or what you would do if you had ultimate freedom and free time. But this idea, like I enjoy what I'm doing. If, if we break up our days into those th- three eight-hour chunks. One of them is gone for sleep. One of them is, is, is that eight hours is your work. And I don't think it, I don't think the healthy approach is let's just push that off for 10 years in our 20s. That's you're gonna, you're not gonna have the freedom later on in life because um, you know, as I think that first guy you were talking about is like, because I worked really hard, now I have the freedom. I don't believe that any career is going to give you the freedom. To me, it's not career. If you want wealth, you have to, it, you're never going to be wealthy from, from your salary. So to me, it doesn't, that, that matters much, much less as it does in terms of what are you doing with your salary and where are you investing it? You get wealthy from investing, not from your salary. So to me, it's just this understanding of how are we going to create this life for ourselves to the point where if you're told, and Julie's probably has more experience than I do, not personally, but from um, just career-wise, someone you know is told that, hey, you have uh, 24 months left. Well, did you go like shifting everything? Because if you go and change everything, to me, it's like, well, why are we not doing that right now? I don't believe the idea should be let's... Um, sacrifice for later on, but also let's not give up planning completely. Planning is good. We want to be able to plan. Winter is coming. And if you just kind of like spend Mm -hmm. all summer in the water hole, you're going to die through winter. But it's not like let's never spend any time in the watering hole. Let's cultivate the crops, but also like recognize that we can have some level of enjoyment now. It's not like we're just going to like give it all up. So It still comes to me back to that idea of um, total balance across all aspects of every role that you play in your life and every aspect that you say is important, whether that's faith, family, health, friends, career, passions, pursuits. Um, I just want I want some level of balance across it so that when you have something that knocks you out of balance a little bit, like I had yesterday, I work out a little bit more of a stressful day than I normally have. But when I got home, Man, like 
I, that that's such. I've I put the effort in to home that when I got went home, I had the ability to just like hang out with my eight year old daughter for you know hours, and that felt like okay, the stress of the day, like in perspective of the whole thing, not a big deal. Had I not had that because I was sacrificing so much before that, I wouldn't have that safe place to go to because I don't have the balance. And to me go like, well, I'll have a really good relationship with my daughter in 20 years when I'm quote successful and created the freedom to do that. Well, I don't know if we're going to get there. So that's, that's like the way that I continually think about it is blur the line between work and play to create this balance across all things, knowing that they will be uneven, but I'm not going to go to either end of the spectrum. To me, that's a, a pretty solid way to chase and pursue this thing. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the Frisbee visual. I think it so much is about the pursuit. I remember this visual from when I went to I went to Tony Robbins <laughs> seminar and he did the visual of a teeter totter, right? Like if you're on a teeter totter, the fun of the teeter totter is going back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to be in perfect balance, you would just be sitting there with someone. And that's not very fun. <laughs> it's like part of the, the excitement and fun of life is like a little bit, you like pushed a little bit this way and that way. And then you try to find that happy, happy medium. But like, if we all achieved a state of perfect balance and we're just sitting there all the time, like life would probably be not that exciting. <laughs> so there's something about enjoying the pursuit, like you said, Ben. And then I think the other thing that really resonated with me was, was just identity, like understanding who you are independent of the things that you do and what, you know, being really sort of secure and content in who that person is so that when you have things that don't go your way or you aren't quite as balanced, it's not like rocking your whole mm -hmm. identity. Um, like because even, I mean, anything can become something that you're chasing, right? Like you could even make having a perfectly balanced life be this thing that you're chasing and you're putting it on this pedestal, like perfection, and then it can become a negative. So there's something about, like we were talking about earlier, just like having this vision for what you want your life to to be like, but not being so attached to the outcome, understanding that it may be different. It may turn out differently than you envision. It may turn out even better, but being open to that and just putting the effort in every day, um, to chase that goal, but not being so attached to a certain outcome. Yeah. I like that a lot. This idea of like, let's let go of perfect. And if it's the Frisbee, um, or the teeter totter recognizing that it's going to wobble, this is the whole idea. Mm -hmm. It's like, there is no such thing as perfect perfection. And as Tony Robbins says, even if there was, you probably wouldn't want it, but it's, we don't even have to worry about that. Cause it's, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen no matter how hard you strive for that. And particularly when you get away from the teeter totter model to the more like the Frisbee or the dinner plate thing, because it's, if it was balancing two things, we might be able to actually do that, but no one's life is made up of two conflicting priorities. It's just not, mm -hmm. it's not like work life because what's involved in life, <laughs> it's not a singular thing. It's so many different aspects. So as we, okay, we're going to be spending, um, an extra hour at the office every day. Okay. That's okay. Particularly if you've worked hard in the past on building some level of homeostasis, but the idea is an hour extra in the office a day for a period of time, we can, we're, uh, we can, should allow ourselves that freedom to do that. But what we want to be aware of is that we're not doing the 20, the 18 to 20 hours in there and the weekends. And that's the like, let's go all in, quote, all in. And as CrossFit athletes, you know, it's this weird, um, I'm trying to get away from words that we've already used before, but it's, it's again, this weird balancing act of, I know that I do need to go all in on this. If I'm going to be, you know, that middle spot of the podium, you know, and Julie got really close, which is amazing. If we're going to try to win this whole thing, it's not about balance. Like if you want to be the best in the world at something, um, you know, Matt Fraser, Elon Musk, Kobe Bryant, um, those guys would be the first ones to tell you it's, it's about going all, it's about obsession. You know, it's, you have to be completely obsessed with that, but that goes back to what we need to do first is define success. And if that is your definition of success, then recognize that that's where you got to go and you got to sacrifice a whole bunch of stuff along the way. 
And I've been lucky enough to be around people that are doing that. And it's amazing to see it in firsthand. It's really cool. It's inspiring, um, sometimes scary, but it's, it's a really interesting thing to be privy to. But what is your, what is my definition of success? And if it's going to be something along the lines of, regardless of when that moment comes, the deathbed comes, I'm looking back and going, I'm so glad I spent my time doing that. Then the all in approach might not be that, um, that where, where we want to put all of our eggs because you might be left with, well, what about the relationships? Well, what about the health? Well, what about the fill in the blank? Julie, I'll give you the last word if you've got any. No, I just, I agree with it all. I think it's really true. It so much comes down to, to understanding what your vision of success is and what your why is, right? And why are you doing it? And I think this for me is the thing that is most important is what's the underlying reason why and keep asking yourself mm -hmm. that like, well, why, why, why keep going deeper and deeper because yeah, I, love that. I find this even in, in working with, with patients on their physical health, you know, we can perfect every single area of the work. Well, I want to have perfect nutrition because you know, that's what you're supposed to do if you're, you know, if you're in the CrossFit world or, or have certain, you know, workout habits or recovery habits or perfect sleep, perfect metrics on your, you know, whoop or whatever. And, you know, if that's all coming from a place of fear or a, a place of not feeling like you're good enough, you know, it ultimately that is still going to, you're never going to be as healthy. That's still going to cause problems later on down the road versus mm -hmm. if your intention behind it is like, you know, I'm doing this because I want to be the best I can be. And I really, you know, care about myself. Then things really start to fall into place. I see so many people who have, you know, health metrics that are out of range that are probably more so due to like, I know you guys talk about all the time, the stress, the cortisol, the trying to be perfect and holding on so much to those outcomes as opposed to the behaviors. And so I think, you know, I, I just see it all the time in, in terms of how our physical health also reflects that. Very cool. Okay. We're going to be back in just a minute for our cool down where we are going to wrap up our most recent 30 day challenge. This week's episode is brought to you by Timeline Nutrition. Head to TimelineNutrition.com slash excellence to learn more about their signature product, MitoPure, which is the first product to offer a precise dose of urolithin A to upgrade mitochondrial function, increase cellular energy, and improve muscle strength and endurance. That last bit is important. Because there's no way around the fact that if we want to kick ass into our 90s, we need to be strong. Timeline Nutrition has shown over the course of 15 years and 11 human clinical trials that urolithin A can alone significantly increase muscle mass and endurance without any other change in lifestyle. So imagine how potent it would be when paired with your regular and consistent trips to the gym. Timeline Nutrition has three different products, a powder mix that's great in smoothies or juices, a whey protein powder, and soft gels for quick and easy access, and they are offering 10% off your first order of MitoPure. So if you want to learn more about how you can give your cells new life, head to TimelineNutrition.com slash excellence and use the code excellence when you're ready to purchase. Again, Timeline Nutrition, T-I-M-E-L-I-N-E. N U T R I T I O N dot com slash excellence. Okay, we are back. We've only got a few minutes before we let Julie back into the world of being a doctor. So we're going to wrap this up quick. We are uh, finishing up our most recent 30 day challenge, which is uh, our attempt to cut our social media use by about 50%. I will go first and say that I am happy to report that I succeeded. I, uh, I think I was, I, w I went from like 55 minutes down to about 28, I think over the last three to four weeks. Uh, and so I will not say it was perfect because what I found myself doing is just doing other things on my phone, which is <laughs> not fully the purpose of the challenge. But so I give myself like a, a check mark, but there's still room for improvement, right? There's still, there's still, for me, it's, it's still improvement to, uh, 
just not pick the stupid thing up when I have two minutes of silence that I'd rather. Oh, I think it's, it's cool, Patrick, <laughs> um, the, that you went to because that's already a really low number when you compare it to like what the, the most people are doing. Yeah. But when you um, kind of pull out that part of your job is social media. Um, True. You, yeah. you by necessity have to be on there for probably 20 of those minutes a day. So that's like, yep. you're doing like five minutes of probably the mindless. Um, so that's, yep. that's really right. impressive. That's, that's really cool. Good job, man. That's Thanks. awesome. How about you? Uh, wow. Who wants I'll, to I'll go. Um, we talked about this a little bit last, ooh, last episode last week, um, where I did a, a really good job. I cut it down from about 30 minutes to 15 minutes a day. Yep. And then I traveled to Europe. <laughs> and yep. uh that's where so mine went up to 40 minutes a day um for this past week just because you weren't just because like you weren't you're in hotel room like you're like you're, 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 like you're in yeah. a hotel room doing nothing and that's what you end up doing it's a, yeah. you know travel is a lot of when you travel without your family it's a lot of it's it's a lot of alone it's lonely um and yeah. that instagram thing is a really entertaining companion um and yeah um so I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes after this, if it falls back to where it was before, if it falls back somewhere closer to where it was in the middle of this challenge. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, it, it was good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy and proud with that, you know, under 20 minutes a day. I think it's really cool. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Julie, cause we haven't talked about where you started from. <laughs> give us a, give us the quick context of like, you know, how bad are you at this in the, to start and then how did, how did it go? This is actually really cool. So I didn't, I joined the challenge a little bit late, so I can't say that I had yes. a, a specific goal of reducing 50%, but it was a good opportunity for me to take a look. And I would be very curious to compare my screen time to a couple years ago to now. Cause I haven't, I, I don't think I've even really looked to, to pay attention, but yeah. That was a big part of my sort of growth when I mentioned in 2020 was really getting away from social media and realizing how it was affecting me. And I think, again, the pendulum is swinging back. I want to be back on it and not be afraid of it like I think I have been. Mm -hmm. But I took a look and I was really quite pleased with myself <laughs> <laughs> that my average is really like 10 minutes a day. Whoa. And damn. Yeah. And, and my top apps that I use are ones that I'm, I'm, you know, very happy with. So, um, it was a cool opportunity for me to look at that. And I think not to say that I don't go on it mindlessly. I notice in, I, I do notice when I'm feeling stressed, when I'm trying to avoid things, that's when I pick it up and I start mindlessly scrolling. Um, but I, I certainly have kind of broken the, uh, addiction that I had. I, I would, I don't know exact numbers, but a couple of years ago, it was a, an unhealthy amount that I was, that I was on Instagram. That's, it just says references type thing. The average screen time is, I mean, there's probably all sorts of conflicting reports on this, but it looks, yep. it, it, it ranges somewhere between three and seven hours a day. Wow. Yeah. Just total screen time. Total screen time. And then for yeah. Instagram, I will say I have done this with my athletes um, because it's like everyone knows, well, like comparison is the thief of all joy and Instagram is mm -hmm. just that comparison game. Um, mm -hmm. If we're trying to lower stress and increase recovery, this is a really low hanging fruit for our athletes to kind of get off of this. And it's really eye opening to see how much time now, again, a lot of them are building their brand and they're using it. to. So some of it's necessitated through, but I don't believe that they're spending um, – most of them were somewhere around that three to four hours a day on social media. Mm -hmm. And these are athletes that are training eight hours a day. So yeah. – Yeah. I was in the – I was in that – I wouldn't say three to four hours, but I know I would have to – I wish I had written down what my numbers were, but it was hours. Yeah. It was not minutes um, before. And it's – it, it, you know, breaking that for a little while, I mean, there's nothing better than doing just a social media holiday to break, just like you do maybe a sugar holiday, yeah. <laughs> just to understand how it's impacting you psychologically. Um, you know, but, but I think also just being mindful of what you're following there. Like I'm very intentional now about the accounts I follow and looking at things that are more uplifting and inspirational instead of, you know, comparison. That's one of the things that I've been really, is like the less you follow, the more, the, the the easier it is to get off of it because you kind of want to scroll until you're like, you've been, you know, 
you're you're up to date or whatever you, they say. You've read the you, internet. Yeah, you're done. <laughs> like I don't even know how they. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm following 31 um, things right now, and that's down from that's, awesome. that's down from 70 at one point. But Maybe that was like, that was like what, that that's was a great challenge. That yeah. was, that was one of the things that that's what I had my athletes do is right away. I was like, okay, how long are you on there? How many are you following? And they'd be like, I'm following 655. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to do an audit, go through and delete 200. Let's get that number down below 450. And yeah. just by that nature of doing that, um, you know, they spend less time. Very cool. Okay, Julie, we got to let you go. Is there anything anywhere, maybe not social media, that you'd like to point people's attention towards? Um, maybe Wild Health or something else? Sure. I mean, I still am on social media. I'm. I'm. It is in my horizon to be more active and sharing more on there again in the future. But um, I'm at Julie Fouché on Instagram. If you want me to look at your posts for ten minutes a day. <laughs> um, but my my podcast is Pursuing Health, and then you can learn about Wild Health at WildHealth.com. Um, they have a podcast as well. Um, and then for anyone who's interested in becoming a patient, um, we have a, a discount code CF wild, um, which will give you a discount on becoming a patient. Yeah. I will say that, um, Love it. it would be, it'd be weird of me not to say this, but I am a patient of wild health and I've had uh, a, a terrific experience with it. It's awesome. Very cool. Julie, thank you so much for taking some time answering our questions. If folks out there want to get a question in the queue for a future episode, find me on Instagram, but only for two seconds a day, just long <laughs> enough to send me a question. P.S. Cummings, drop me a DM. Uh, thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Thank you for sharing the show with your friends. Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. 